Recently, we looked at the Nintendo DS port of LEGO Indiana Jones, the first one. It's a very different title than the console version. I dare to call it weird, and I especially dare to call it an absolute delight. You can check out the full video for more than the broad strokes, and if you missed it, you may want to, because there is going to be some continuity for this one. Fun fact, in that one, I made a crack about eels, and then the new movie came out containing a scene prominently featuring eels. I can't even tell you just how delighted I was to have accidentally predicted that. Anyway, today we're looking at the handheld version of the second game, LEGO Indiana Jones 2 The Adventure Continues. Eagle-eared viewers might have noticed I used the more general term handheld rather than specifying down to the Nintendo DS. Put a pin in that. That part gets interesting and we're coming back to it. First though, I want to make sure everyone's on the same page with the console version. LEGO Indy 2 is already a weird game in the first place, and not just for the thematic juxtaposition I talked about last time. It's just weird in terms of game design, and is legitimately unique in terms of the LEGO series. The entries prior all had a distinct hub between levels for all the non-level stuff, and then the levels for all the level stuff. Indy DOS wasn't content doing the same thing though. It got experimental, in a way that makes it one of the most significant individual titles in the series for what it brought to the table. If you like tearing through the dark streets of Gotham in the Batmobile, or freely exploring a magic castle that also for some reason straight up uses slave labor but it's okay bro, the slaves like to be slaves, then it's LEGO Indiana Jones 2 that turned the series in this direction. Instead of the larger focus on levels, The Adventure Continues puts a larger focus on bigger hub worlds. The OG3 movies each get their own individual worlds, meaning you can cross the world-famous bridge that stretches from Nepal directly into Egypt. A new kid on the block, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, got split into three slightly more coherent worlds dividing up its plot. Vehicle levels play out like a zany demolition derby within larger areas where you play Grand Theft Jungle Cutter and pick up power-ups, like one which lets your car jump in the air. <laughs> There's also an increased emphasis on crazy huge boss fights, causing some pretty drastic changes within the canon. My personal favorite is defeating the Wrath of God by sneaking under crates like Solid Snake. The final major change was the inclusion of a level builder, and an impressive one at that. Technically, this did return for the next game, the first Harvey Potter, but it loses a lot of its luster there, considering that most characters have 80% of the same abilities as each other, and also implicit anti-Semitism. Jesus Christ, that franchise has aged like goat milk in a sauna. Now, the massive changes and noticeable growing pains, which aren't relevant to this video, make Indy 2 one of the more contentious entries in the LEGO series, but I'm on board with its brand of bat shittery so it will be fun to contrast against the handheld port. That's right, pulling that pin back out. This version of the game wasn't just on the Nintendo DS. It was on the PlayStation Portable as well. That is the version I'm using here, mainly for prettier footage, but also for an interesting dilemma it presents for the game. I did play a little bit of the DS port to confirm they are the same, and other than some minor control changes to fit the DS features and visual downgrades, they are. In contrast to the two small heads of the first game, this Nintendo DS port has heads that are proportionally too large. Personally, I consider it an improvement, but I've also fallen for the trap that is Funko Pops, so maybe don't trust my judgment on this specific point. Oh fuck, Ezra Miller! As for the PSP version, I've been holding a card close to my chest since the last video. Indy 1 was also on the PSP, and I deliberately skirted around any mention of it just for this moment. It wasn't this version of the game. It was the full fucking game. Textures lost resolution. That was the major trade-off. Though on the PSP screen, that's barely a trade-off in the first place. Indy 1 was cross-gen on PS2 and PS3, and the PSP was already operating at a similar enough level to the older console to handle the experience. Indy 2, on the other hand, was the first purely next-gen LEGO title of its era, so it's entirely possible that it simply could not have run on the device. I am not technically knowledgeable enough to know. That's not my concern, though. I'm interested in expectations. Imagine being a kid, unaware of any marketing or pre-release details, who had the first game for PSP and accordingly expected the full console experience. The handheld ports already face an uphill battle. With this in mind, that hill just got steep. 
Can the handheld port of LEGO Indiana Jones 2 possibly hold up to such intense scrutiny? You bet your bottom ass it can. I still don't quite think it reaches the level of the console version, because I think the sheer novelty alone gives that one several extra points in the big picture of this series. But I guarantee you other people will fervently disagree on that point. Many will even say this port exceeds its big sister. Don't take my word for it. I had comments on the last video saying this directly and unprompted. If I believed in free will, I'd even say they used it here. However... The point is, if you didn't like Indy 2, this one may be just the version for you. In fact, people in that boat may even go so far as to say this is outright the best Indiana Jones game we got that year. I'm sorry, I don't mean it. You'll always be very important to me. He's a very special child. Quickly comparing this one to the last handheld port, there are a few noticeable upgrades. Some issues with collision detection disappear. Voices are now distinct from LEGO Star Wars. There is no more texture warping, and water is no longer lethal. Several characters also have noticeably more accurate designs. Some of these are just because there were new physical minifigs to go off in between games, but even pre-existing figures like Indy and Marion get more accurate legs and face and hair, respectively. And what is an utterly inexplicable move, though, Indy's face is now wrong. That's not the right head. The old Lego Indy has a very distinctive face, and this one is far more generic. It's not horribly out of line, but how the ballsack did they get the protagonist's face wrong? Since Indy also has his leg printing now, it cued me into what was happening with the hips last time. If a character has front hip printing, it inexplicably repeats that design on the back. So everyone with belt buckles have an especially distracting back belt buckle. Visual presentation is otherwise doing a pretty solid job, other than some random wobbliness in certain animations, and I really liked one particular shot just for being cool. Straight badass. This port eschews compressing down console cutscenes and tells out the story as entries in Indy's journal per the framing narrative we will discuss briefly. You can zoom in on each picture if you want a better look, and these try to be funny, but the humor rarely landed for me. It's usually just pretty elementary level wordplay, except for a fart joke early on. I do have one nitpick with the audio presentation, specifically the music. Indiana Jones famously has great music. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull has a phenomenal soundtrack itself, with the Crystal Skull's eerie leitmotif being a personal favorite. The console version uses all of the new music to incredible effect. This version, though, leaves that out. We do have a swelling, adventurous variation of the main theme, and that's about it. That's essentially the only piece of music you'll be hearing. It gets very redundant. They neglected the better part of four movies worth of music. I use more pieces of royalty-free music in my videos than this entire game used, even though the company had full licensed access to so much more. There are a few broader design sensibilities in line with the console version. It's actively trying to do something novel here, and they even emulated the hub world concept as best as they could, considering the limitations of the weakest hardware utilized. Sorry Nintendo DS, that means you. Still love you, baby. There's only one hub world, and it actually gives us a unique framing device for the story. Indiana and Marion are flying off on their honeymoon after their wedding at the end of Crystal Skull. Oh, yeah. Inexplicably, nearly every major villain from the movies has come back to life and infiltrated the plane. They try to steal Indy's journal, leading to a less graceful touchdown. The comedic timing here is pretty impeccable. <laughs> Honeymoon Island becomes the hub. The beach itself with the shop, the character customizer, and the trophy gallery only lets you use Indy and Marion, probably so they can have privacy. For sex. God can't stop them, they're married now. Weirdly, once you make a custom character, 
They just stand there on the porch watching. I'm not shaming you if you're into that kind of thing, but it is weird here. Across the rest of the island, you interact with the villains. What the hell is that? Dialogue. You're not supposed to be talking for another three years. <clears throat> you interact with the villains and the environment to unlock journal pages and red bricks. You only need the first one during the tutorial to unlock these story levels, which then just unlock by playing them in progression. The other pages unlock minigame challenges, four per movie. There's already a great amount of variety here on the island, because no two villains present the same puzzle or challenge. For example, Lao Shea is comparatively cooperative, striking a deal to give you the page if you give him crabs. Whereas Mola Ram, quite antagonistically, must be reached dodging past a series of deadly minecarts. Tot is up on the island's mountain peak, and you have to defeat him and his henchmen in a snowball fight with unique, dedicated gameplay mechanics. It would almost be wholesome if, you know, he weren't Gestapo. Not all villains are quite as well utilized. Irina Spalko takes a backseat to the Nazi monkey because it mugged her for the relevant journal page, so she just gets stuck giving you the directions on how to sneak up on it for whenever it randomly spawns into the island. Belik and Dovchenko are the only human antagonists to get lumped together for the same collectible page which absolutely threw me off. How it's supposed to work is that you find Belik and then he gives you a riddle which leads you to Dovchenko, where you find the page. However, the game spawns in Dovchenko from the outset and he has far fewer steps to reach than Belik. So I had already gotten that page when Belik came strolling out way too late, like Riddler after suffering a severe concussion. I only needed one more page at that point, so this baffled me. How was I supposed to know I'd already solved that puzzle? Turns out, the real final page was one I had to dig up elsewhere, even though the game didn't mark it with the stars that typically mark buried booty. I sure love it when games cheat within their own systems. Sadly, the classic movies are purely relegated to these challenges and don't get any reinterpreted levels like the console port, and the levels exclusively focus on Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. While that one is the most hotly contested movie in the franchise, it doesn't really hurt the experience here. It translates easily into interesting and varied levels. This shouldn't be surprising. The LEGO games are good at making even far worse movies more palatable. My literal first thought in the theater after watching The Rise of Skywalker was, well, at least it'll be fun in the next LEGO Star Wars. But that's beside the point. Where the main game would often, though not always, have brief levels, sometimes as short as one small area, with collectibles being reserved to a single mini-kit once you return in free play, these are more in line with the series norm. They are longer and still contain the mini-kits and the treasure maps from last time, though mini-kits are now golden fedoras instead of idols, which is amusing. Indy doesn't need more hats, he pretty famously has his first one. This wasn't even the only Indiana Jones game that just used fedoras for collectibles that year. You really are a special thing, ain't ya? These also get the upgrade of unlocking full LEGO builds instead of the more limited trophies of Yesterport. Let's take a look at our abilities this time. Any abilities missing before are missing again, so no high jumps, no wrenches, no monkey negotiations, etc. I'm not here to negotiate anymore, monkey! Children no longer get to crawl through tiny access tunnels. Thanks, OSHA. The new abilities in the console version, water to extinguish fire, the staff of raw to redirect light beams, and mind control potions and perfumes, which are somehow different abilities, are also left out. The whip has everything it could do before, but now there are places where you can lower it down for other characters to climb up. Shovels still dig, but can also be used to pry open crates. Strong characters have special buttons they punch. Characters with blades can cut ropes, and Mutt also gains the ability to climb specific walls. Women and children can shimmy along narrow ledges, and there are locations where characters can do the leg up thing that Uncharted loves so much, so long as the boost Er is strong enough and the boost E is light enough. There's actually a very elaborate, uh, hierarchy, I guess of who can boost whom and which characters can boost characters of their own weight class, which is quite amusing considering how much thought someone put into LEGO minifigures chucking each other into the air. I honestly respect it. 
Someone put more thought into this one feature than an entire writing team put into Assassin's Creed Unity. Since Marion gets the benefit of these upgrades, her unique skills from last time are nerfed down a bit, probably because they were worried she was getting OP. False concern, really, considering how much she pulls off in Raiders. Did you see how many Nazis she absolutely ended? Certified gangster. What this means for gameplay is that, while her bottles are still her primary projectile weapon, they no longer explode upon fire to destroy otherwise impervious bricks. So the only explosive puzzles you'll see use weird bamboo bombs provided by the level. Quite tragically, she also can no longer turn into an undead monkey. They ask you how you are and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Until you buy her younger versions for free play, then it's zombie monkey time, baby! There's also a special free play version of Mutt that adds in the monkey ability to his other suite of skills, and I want to dig in even deeper to the implications, but because I am who I am, that rabbit hole goes deep. I'll save that for the end of the video as an incentive for you to stick around. Yes, I know you can technically skip ahead. Please do not. I worked very hard on the inappropriate jokes in the middle of this video. Back to the abilities, most of the access panels are gone. Thuggies, Nazis, and Brotherhood of the Cruciform Sword members get nothing. Academics discard their boring-ass historical documentation and can pick locks by memorizing the keys. No idea what that has to do with higher education, but then again, I did drop out of college for having too much swagger. They also keep their umbrellas for melee, though specialty zip lines have been cut. Finally, the Crystal Skull also gets similar abilities to the console port, where it can dispel swarms of bugs, but it also gets a nice buff where it can use telekinesis to build items like the Force. Occasionally, it can even rebuild the same bricks multiple ways for multiple purposes, but this is very underused, as only a couple of puzzles emphasize this, and the rest of the time you only ever need to use it once for a single configuration. Combat is actually simplified, even from last time. Weapon pickups are heavily de-emphasized and really only happen on occasion for puzzles. The first time, you pick up a revolver for shooting a target. The next time, you pick up a bazooka for shooting a target. More explosively, sure, but it's fundamentally the same action. Since you need these weapons for progressing, you will no longer lose them upon death, but it's so rare you pick one up that it's hardly a buff. There is a new class of enemy now available, bugs. If you just go in swinging, they take the same three hits as everyone else in the game, but they also die instantly if you jump on them, or frankly, if you even just jump in their general proximity, it would seem. The only downside is that they typically keep spawning until you destroy their anthill or solve whatever puzzle is needed to block their spawn points. Vehicle levels mostly no longer exist in the overhead form we saw last time, barring a brief similar moment driving the duck boat down the river, but there are technically a few other techniques for vehicular representation. Generally speaking, there are sometimes vehicles you can drive within the level. Controls are mediocre. You turn on left and right, but acceleration and reverse are set to both up and down, and also two of the face buttons, which is the method I recommend, because the other one is not intuitive. The jungle chase scene uses a setup like the convoys in the first game, which I like a lot. It is funnier because you can see the drivers now, which makes it far more obvious that they don't give a shit about their comrades getting murked around them. They are specifically being paid to drive forward, linger, drive backwards, and linger. Frankly, they're really only keeping this job so they don't lose their dental coverage. And I respect that. Workers of the world. We are being exploited. It's long past time we join together and overthrow- The remaining vehicle level is a bit sillier. It's the motorcycle chase, but instead of the thrilling high speed back and forth between motorcycle and car, darting in and out of the buildings on campus, you have to keep dismounting to manually solve each puzzle, so that you can then drive the motorcycle to the next area, and dismount, and repeat. You're honestly just better abandoning the motorcycle and going on foot, because the game will just spawn it alongside you in each new room. Level design otherwise keeps the high bar set from last time, and is always just doing neat and unexpected things. For example, in the level against the ants, Indy and Oxley actually fall into their deep, labyrinthine anthill below ground. These ants are devious. You have to build handrails to climb up before they bear down on you. 
Sometimes individual swarms just dive bomb you. And the most dastardly trick of all, they corrupted my original video footage from their level. Thank God you can replay story missions in this series or I would have been real pissed. Another level sees Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent god of wind and rain, creator of puny humanity and the world itself, rise up out of the lava. Okay, technically it's just a statue of Quetzalcoatl, but you get to defeat it by tossing explosives into its eye sockets, so it was still a freaking cool moment. Death traps are even more clever and varied than before. I personally like these two-faced panels that either spit out a blue stud or impale you on a spear completely unpredictably. The graveyard level also just has smart puzzle design, where you have to jump into portals without initially knowing which other portal each connects to. Sadly, boss fights are more de-emphasized than the console version, not counting Quetzalcoatl in the mix since that's non-resistant deicide at best. Irina Spalko's final boss is okay, where she uses lasers and a pistol, while you have to activate the crystal skeletons to mindfuck her. Dovchenko's is more anticlimactic. You just shove him in the ants. Yeah, that's more accurate to the movie. But the ants swarming together into a mecha formation to step on you instead is a much more fun experience all around. Now, all of this is just the stuff within the normal gameplay mechanics. If you're less familiar with the broader, overarching trends of 3D platformers, you can oversimplify the entire genre into two categories, which I'll explain using Spyro the Dragon, the coolest of the 3D platformer mascots. Crash Bandicoot can slurp my shaft. The first category is like Spyro the original. A large majority of the game is all about using the default gameplay mechanics, and while there can be special levels with a different setup, those are the minority and typically all share the same secondary gameplay mechanics as each other. The second category is like Spyro 2. A significant portion of the game consists of mini-games, and most or all of these have unique mechanics instead of sharing them between mini-games. The LEGO franchise nearly always falls under the first category. I'm predicting that you've already figured out this port falls under the second category. If I predicted wrong, I apologize. My psychic powers only work when eels are involved. This version of Indie 2 is routinely throwing in new set pieces and activities and challenges, and broadly, they work well. A lot of times, there will be the option to unlock a minikit if you complete them under a particular time or with a particular score. One plays like an endless runner, years before subway surfers started cluttering up that kind of clickbait video. Another is a blow dart shooting gallery where player two keeps popping up like a dummy in the middle of enemies. I've already mentioned the snowball fight. There's a whack-a-mole that lets you combo off of the groundhog's heads. There's a great parkour challenge where bullets are whizzing all around you, which yes, can hit you. There's a sword fight. And there's one where you have to execute indigenous warriors by dropping them into lava for daring to protect their native lands from invading forces. Uh, that, that one feels a bit mean. Not all of these are fun. One late in the game gives you a first-person crossbow to shoot bamboo bombs out of the air while Oxley builds bridges off in the distance as slowly as humanly possible. It wouldn't be so bad, except you can take a maximum of one hit if you want to get the mini kit, and it isn't quite polished enough to make that an easy demand. As mentioned, most of the island's journal pages unlock four mini games per movie, loosely based on specific scenes. Unfortunately, most of these get too frustrating to be fun. For example, there's a Cairo platforming level where various rooftops, awnings, and camels make zigzagging paths to get to Marion in a punishingly strict time limit. Also, when you jump on the camels, they fart. And this is going to be my legacy. I'm going to be remembered for talking about Lego farts. Some of them get worse from there. The climb up the castle tower from Last Crusade makes the admittedly loose platforming even more unwieldy, because the environment is inside of a tight cylinder, and the curve throws off so much of your muscle memory. There are still points of interest in these. Two of Crystal Skulls are racetracks. Racetracks with shitty handling, but they're interesting nonetheless. My favorite sees the monkey put in so much unnecessary danger. 
Look at these fucking dudes, willing to chop right through a small primate they clearly saw coming. They're not being paid to avoid stabbing a capuchin, they're really just keeping this job for the dental. Workers of the world, we need to- The cast of characters is again a solid representation of the franchise, with a few more exclusive variations in this version, like the main cast getting their wedding outfits once you beat the story. Also, the clown's back. In a... in case you were worried. About the weird clown from last time. He's still here. You can calm down. Red bricks are pretty much the same as last time. By that I mean fast build, regenerating hearts, invincibility and one hit kills, and the stud multipliers all return. And the only additional one is that they remembered to include studs times eight this time. Otherwise, the only other content was a build your own adventure option in the store, which I briefly got excited for, hoping for some degree of a level builder or level remixer or something cool, but it was sadly just replaying the 16 movie minigames back to back. The game touted this as a way to unlock bonus movies, but I did the first one and it was just one of the cutscenes from the console, so I decided not to torture myself any further replaying some of those. If I missed something neat and exclusive, you'll have to let me know in the comments. I will believe any lie you tell me. One thing that I did not overlook, however, so do not be typing it in the comments section, is the game's secret ending. That's right, you can unlock a secret ending for this game. In it, Indy and Marion get through a new gateway to discover that there has been a resort on this island the entire time. One of the patrons is even a stormtrooper, and not just any stormtrooper, but the best stormtrooper, the beach stormtrooper from the LEGO Star Wars games. Indy absolutely takes a peek at those sweet, sweet man titties. There's a very sweet moment. Indy and Marion are out sunbathing, when all of a sudden, Indy realizes there's some sort of secret still on the island indicated by the map that he has. However, when Marion gets frustrated at him falling back into his usual shenanigans. He very respectfully puts all of that away so that they can focus on their quality time together. And the beach stormtrooper is having absolutely none of that. I'm not sure exactly what's got this guy frustrated. I'm not sure if he thinks Indy should have gone after the treasure. I'm not sure if it's the public display of affection. I'm not sure if he wishes he had a gorgeous babe like Marion. Or maybe even have a rugged, strong, incredibly capable hunk like Indy. I've forgotten what I was talking about. All in all, this port of the game is yet again a consistently solid experience. While the further simplification of several abilities and the lack of more fleshed out content for the classic trilogy are certainly downsides, the whole experience here is just so much more polished that it mostly exceeds the first handheld port, and even when it doesn't cross that line, it's still a worthy follow-up. Now, I've saved the best for last. My monkey theory. One which I think ties everything together. And I do mean everything. It all started with a single question. What if this isn't shape-shifting in the usual sense? Let's look at the timeline. Marion can only swap out with the monkey at a younger age. At some point, but not during the events of Crystal Skull, Mutt can do the same thing. It's also not one of the generic monkeys he swung around with. It is distinctly wearing the same garb as the Nazi monkey. Since their temporal contemporaries cannot both access the monkey, it would seem the monkey can only possess one person on the mortal plane at a time. I use the word possess intentionally. Over in the DC universe, there is a powerful demon named Etrigan. In order to limit his evil spread, Merlin the Wizard bound him to one of King Arthur's knights, Sir Jason Blood. And so, Etrigan can only emerge onto Earth when Jason explicitly speaks the command to allow it, and they swap forms in the same body. What if the monkey is doing the same thing here? We know there is some version of a Judeo-Christian god in this world, so there is quite plausibly some version of hell too. Since the monkey is a Nazi, it would absolutely go straight to hell upon death. Perhaps Satan was particularly impressed with the depths of evil in this monkey's heart. 
If you're wondering, the Larry Boy video game created the implication that his villain, the Bad Apple, is Lucifer Incarnate. You can check out my video for the finer details there. Yes, I do find it strange that these E-rated games I keep covering keep leading me back to themes of eternal damnation, but that's beside the point right now. Let's say Satan grants the monkey the ability to continue its work, form shifting with a willing human. That would explain why these swap pads are red, because they are linked to hell, which is obviously red because of all the hellfire. Now, at first, Marion wouldn't know the monkey is demonically powered. As we all know, monkeys cannot talk. However, at some point, she finds out and rejects the demon Nazi monkey's power. Perhaps the holy presence of God gave it away, which is why she cannot do it after the events of Raiders. The years go by. Frustrated by losing this foothold into the mortal realm, Satan uses more of her power to unleash the souls of all the major adversaries of one Dr. Henry Jones Jr., who has firmly cemented himself as an enemy of Satan by accepting Jesus' grace by drinking from the Christ Cup. They ambush Indy and Marion on the plane, not just because of their vulnerability, but for one key item. Indiana's journal. You see, the interdimensional beings of Akator discovered how to fully travel between planes of reality. Certainly, that would be useful information for the forces of Hell to have, so that they can better compete in a world where multiple religious pantheons exist and intervene with humanity. Since the aliens have already GTF out of there, smashing up the place on exit, Indy's records of events are probably their next best bet for that information. Unfortunately for them, Lego Indy was only capable of bad puns and bitching about broken elevators. But the monkey wasn't done just yet. There was a new opening revealed. Mutt's opening. And the monkey was ready to fill it. In the journal, Mutt's thrilling encounter swinging across the vines with the capuchins would reveal his vulnerability. This was Mutt's shining moment. The way he moved so gracefully, surrounded by spiritual peers to save the day. Mutt wouldn't be able to reach this peak again out in the normal world. He would never know the true freedom that monkeys know again. And deep down, this was a bitter pill to swallow. This is where the Nazi monkey would be able to swoop in with the same arrangement she presented to Marion. That's right, it's been a girl monkey this whole time, and you didn't even realize it. Bind my soul to yours and become the monkey you long to be. Bind your soul to me, and return to monkey. The free play variant of Mutt shows us exactly what choice he made. Tragically, this is the worst possible choice he could make. Spoilers for Dial of Destiny incoming. Because Lego Mutt has pledged his Lego soul to a Lego demon Nazi monkey, when he dies in the Lego Vietnam War, he is bound for a spot in Lego Hell. Some of you may be wondering how this theory, uh, works, with the fact that Marion can also turn into the monkey in the level in Cairo before she dies eating the poison date. And... And... You know, maybe you, specifically, should stop worrying about the specifics. It's just a Lego game. Maybe you shouldn't take it so seriously. <laughs> Hold on, one quick thing before I end. You guys, I want to thank you so much for the huge support you gave on the video about the DS port. I expected my usual numbers, a few hundred views after a few weeks, but holy crap, you guys watched that thing 85,000 times as of writing. That is insane, and I thank you so much for that. Considering my subscribers have also jumped up by about 2,000 in that same time frame, a lot of you are probably new. Welcome to Baneshake! I've got an ongoing long-form series about the Assassin's Creed games, currently through Unity and the Chronicles spin-offs, with Syndicate coming up next, and I've started doing the same for Arkham as well, with Asylum and City covered so far. Otherwise, I typically cover random games that pique my interest, as I have done today, and sometimes I even branch out with things like unnecessary censorship or goofy little think piece video essays. If you enjoyed this, this is the sort of tone and style I just about always go for, and I certainly appreciate anyone who decides to poke around on my channel a little. I've been doing this for, hell, 
eight years now, so there's plenty to choose from. Regardless, if you're willing to like and comment, that always helps. I'd love to see you back if you want to subscribe. But even just you watching all the way to the end means the world to me. <laughs>